Would you join me in a word of prayer? So, Lord, I know that without you, it's not going to be effective. So we invite you here. Make this about you, Lord. It's not me in my, in my testimony. It's about you and your faithfulness in my testimony, Lord. So make your glory shine, Lord. Do a work, Lord. I don't know what people are going through, but obviously you put this in my heart. So we just pray for your word to go forth and do exactly what it was meant to do. Even if it's my testimony, Lord, and my story. So, bless it. Be glorified in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, as you guys know, a testimony in Christian circles is just someone's story of how they got saved. Basically, that's what it is. Now, we're fascinated with testimonies of people like Raul Reese, Nick Cruz. We look back in history and marvel at people like Martin Luther and how they turned to the Lord. And of course, talking about radical testimonies and conversions, we cannot ignore the Apostle Paul and his radical conversion on the road to Damascus. But simply put, a testimony is someone's story of how they got saved. Or if you want to put it, how they became born again. It's their story. Speaking of stories, I read this on the internet of a story of somebody who's very precious. She's an 80-year-old. It's her story, and if you don't mind, I'm going to read it. Now, the local news station was interviewing a precious 80-year-old lady because she had gotten married for the fourth time. And the interviewer asked uh, a question about, and she, he was asking and he was saying, now, you know, tell me a little bit about this marriage, and she, well, she said, well, I'm 80, and this guy I'm marrying is a funeral director. And so this guy's like, the interviewer's like, well, that, that's pretty interesting. And so as they're going along in this interview, he said, would you mind telling me a little bit more about the first three husbands you had? And so she paused a few minutes, needing time to reflect on her life. After a short time, a smile came on her face, and she said, well, and uh, she explained that her first marriage was in her 20s, and she married a banker. Well, the second marriage was uh, in her 40s, and it was a circus ringmaster. In her 60s, she married her third husband, who was a preacher. And now, finally in her 80s, she's marrying a funeral director. So now the interviewer is like, wow, this is astonishing. This is amazing. Now, why such diverse careers with the men you've married? And then she paused again for some contemplation. And then she, again, replied with a smile. Well, I married one for the money, two for the show, three to get ready, and four to go. <laughs> Anyways, uh... <laughs> So if you don't mind, I want to take this time to tell my story. And I hope it, it doesn't become about me, because my story is, the, is not about me, but it's about God's faithfulness and how I became a Christian. Now, interesting, the night before Pastor Tom sent me an email asking me to share it on Sunday, uh, I think this was like two weeks ago, uh, the night before I got the email, I had a dream. And the dream was that I was actually here sharing my testimony from this pulpit. Now, I've been here before, so I was fam familiar with this whole setup. And I dreamed that I was actually here, standing here, sharing my testimony. And then the very next day, I got a, an email from Pastor Tom. And so when I replied, and I said, you know what, I would love to share in your absence. And then I told him about my dream. He said, wow, brother. You know, he said, bro, you know how he talks, well, bro, um, love for you to share your testimony. And so, if you don't mind, let me share my testimony. So, I was born in Taiwan to Christian parents. Now, my father was a pastor also. He was a seminary grad, and my mom, too, was a seminary grad. She was a music major, a music teacher, and they actually had really, really great lives in Taipei, Taiwan, because they were both educated. Now, back then, in the 70s, 
in Taiwan, there were not many educated people. And so they had a really good life. And then they had uh, my sister, and then they had me in 1971. But when they started to, uh, you know, when I started getting older and all these things, they knew that it was time to leave Taiwan and immigrate to America. Now, it wasn't because they were trying to chase the American dream. That wasn't it, okay? Their lives were pretty good in Taiwan. Why would you leave? It was because of Taiwan's policy that if you were a male child, then um, their policy is that if you got to the age of 11 or 12, then you are no longer allowed to leave the country until you serve two years in the uh, Taiwanese military at the age of 18 or 19. So my father and my mom decided that they did not want me to serve in the Taiwanese army. My father had served, and so he didn't want me to do that. So my father got a student visa to come to America to study here. Obviously, he's a very smart man, and so he came to study, and uh, he, he and my mother left Taiwan in 1978. They left us there. Now, I was supposed to start second grade at the time in the fall. However, my sister and I, we just kind of stayed behind because they wanted us to kind of go from uncle to uncle to aunt to uncle to kind of say goodbye, to do our farewell tour, if you will, you know? That's how important we were. Anyway, so, now, obviously, because of that, I didn't have, like, I didn't go to second grade. I skipped it, so. Well, it was May of 1979 when my sister and I were put on this large jumbo 747 jet. We flew across the country by ourselves. She was nine and I was eight. Now, what happened was um, my uncles, they took us to the airport, asked the flight attendant. That's, this is true. They said, oh, would you mind making sure they make their connecting flight in uh, Hawaii? And that was it. Now, looking back, it's scary because I could have been, like, left. And, you know, so, well... Um, we got to LAX, you know, on the flight. It was a Saturday. It was, um, I believe it was a, let's see, it was Saturday. Okay, so I still remember getting off with the flight attendant, seeing my father and my mother in the distance behind this, this big glass divider. I was so excited to see them because I hadn't seen them for a whole year. Well, we got there on a Saturday, like I said. Guess what? <clears throat> Two days later. Monday, they stuck us in the elementary school there. Now, this was May, okay? At the end of the school year, we spoke no English. It was, uh, well, the school was called Sierra Vista in East LA. So if you guys know anything about East LA, it's pretty ghetto, all right? It's predominantly Hispanic, Mexicans, and so, Talk about standing out. We stood out, stood out like a sore thumb, okay? And so that was it. Now, they took us to the school. In fact, that day, we got our American names. I don't think my mom and my dad had any plans to give us, like, American names, at least, you know, not then. But when we got there to Sierra Vista, the administrator of Sierra Vista wouldn't allow us to be enrolled in the school unless we had American names. And so, I mean, go figure. And so basically, my uncle, who was accompanying my mom, uh, he was actually carrying his Bible like this. He said, what? Okay, so he opened up his Bible. He said, okay, uh, this one will be Esther, and this one's Stephen. That's how we got our names. I'm actually very thankful and proud of my name, Stephen, because his story in Acts chapter 6 and 7 always inspires me. But I often wonder what it would have been like for me if my uncle would have flipped the Bible open just one page to the left. You know what I mean, right? One page to the left is Acts chapter 5. It's the story of Ananias and Sapphira. <laughs> what if you would have turned the page and be like, uh, this one is Ananias. And this one's Sapphira, right? My sister and I would have been stuck with the names Ananias and Sapphira. Imagine like going to youth group and I am Ananias. 
And so, anyway, so we grew up in East LA. Now to just sum up kind of my childhood and how it was like there, uh, picture if you will, uh, being around all these people you've never, ever seen. And then for them to be around you, now they've never, ever seen a real, live, like authentic Chinese person. They've never. Now they've seen Bruce Lee movies and you know, Bruce Lee movies were very popular in those days and so, but they were just like, wow, what the heck is, <laughs> what the heck is this guy? And so, you know, imagine it was a difficult life. It really was. Going to school there. Now, let me just describe. Student body was about 90% Mexicans, 5% blacks, 4% whites, and then there was me and my sister. <laughs> Do the math. And to sum it up, uh, how it was like, at home it was pretty rough in the early years, okay? My mom and my dad fought a lot. And if I recall correctly, they would fight, I mean, really bad uh, on a weekly basis. And I, I'm talking about big time fights where uh, there'll be threats made and, and, and things thrown and, you know? So that was kind of the life I had. And then we moved around a lot too I was, when I was young because I didn't understand it. But now looking back, and actually when I was in high school, I was told this, okay? Because we moved around a whole lot. And at high school, I was told by my parents, well, it's because, you know, Steve, my student visa ran out and we were actually staying in America illegally. <laughs> so we were trying to escape the hands of the immigration office. That's why we moved from place to place. And I didn't know that. And so, I was also part of my life. And then finally, in sixth grade, uh, my father bought this house, a modest house in West Covina, which is very interesting because it's the only West something that is not West of that thing. <laughs> you look on the map, Covina's right here, okay? Now, West Co uh, you guys, well, flip it around. The West, uh, Covina's right here. West Covina is actually southeast of Covina, but it's called West Covina. Anyways, go figure. So uh, we bought our house, at least my parents bought our house in West Covina. It's a modest house. We're so excited. Start afresh. But see, things didn't change. The fighting and the yelling and the threats were always there. And see, the thing is, most of the time they fought about their finances because it was tough. It was really tough. Now, my father was so ministry-minded. He was so, I hate to use the word ambitious, but he was. He wanted to remain a pastor, so he never had a, like a career that he pursued. He always had jobs, but not careers where it supported the family. So my mom was always working a lot and a lot and very hard to kind of provide. Very far different life from the, what they had in Taiwan. And then to make matters worse, the fights would begin to escalate into him accusing my mom of her family treating him wrong, and, which they did, but I'm not going to get into that. But, you know, so it would get physical, and anyways, that's how I grew up, okay? I grew up a very frightened, frightened, anxious little boy, always just kind of locked up uh, in my room trying to deal with all the screaming, the, the, the yelling, the Things getting broken and shoving and pushing and threats and, and all these things on a weekly, if not bi-weekly, if not more basis. And I have to kind of explain something too, okay? I know uh, maybe it was the, the stress of the ministry. I don't know. Or maybe because it was the stress of living in America, the financial stress. But my father, uh, as I've always known him, has, has always been very distant. Okay, he's never been a very close kind of person. And so I can honestly say that I don't remember one single meaningful conversation with him since we came to America. And even to this day, it's just gotten to a point where it's not like we're going to really connect. And many times... Our conversations, this is literal, okay? Growing up, my teens, our conversations and passing will be like, 
How's the, how's the Lakers? Doing good. How'd they do last night? They won. How'd the Magic do? You know, it was good. Or if it was baseball season, it was about the Dodgers. And that was it. Very true. And so to be honest, I, I have to describe this because it, it, it became who I was. Uh, as a teenager, very lonely, very scared, very shy, very anxious, very confused, very insecure, and yelling and fighting and the neglect by my parents made me just lock myself up in my room, and whether it was after school, whether it was after practice, whether it was uh, in the summer, uh, people in the neighborhood, kids in the neighborhood would knock on the door to want to play. I'd be like, no, I don't want to play. And so, I mean, think about it. Imagine never having one single birthday party until you're like in your 20s. My parents were always so ministry-minded and busy in the ministry. My first birthday party was in my early 20s, and my sister threw it for me. So obviously, I, I never thought I was good enough. I was, you know, never thought I measured up. I always felt stupid. Uh, my grades, you know. Never once did my parents sit down to help me with my homework. Never. So I kind of had to navigate through things myself, textbooks and all these things. They were just too busy. In fact, there were times in my teenage years, okay, when my mom would just cook a dinner very early, and then they would leave for whatever ministry, whatever they were doing. And then, uh, you know, they would leave the dinner on the table, and that night I would just find myself there by myself, eating the dinner and just, you know, that was it. You know, that was my life. So, I mean, understand, I was really, I really felt unwanted. Unwanted, maybe like the, the ugly duckling because, you know, they never cont contemplated, uh, con how do I say it? Complimented. There you go. That was the word. They never complimented me. They never said good hair. They never said good tan. They never, no, nothing like that, okay? Nothing. And so that was me. And so that was my life before high school and after high school. But now things changed when I went to college. I went to um, UC Irvine. And uh, for the first time in my life, think about this. This is like, I'm 18. First time in, li in my life, I actually had a girlfriend. Now, there were a lot of girls that liked me in high school, but I was so shy, I, I, would, I didn't know what to say to them. And so I always like, just like ran away, basically. And so, but let me share something. This is, you're going to think this is very stupid or very, like, I'm, a, I'm very full of myself or something. But I have to share this because it's germane to the story, okay? It's very important to the story. When I got to college, and my, my wife is just like, oh, my gosh, he is so stupid. He's going to share this. But uh, for the first time in my life, in college, it was like, I realized, man, I'm a good-looking guy. <laughs> you know, I was just like, Wow, and I don't know uh, the mirror, the lighting in my apartment. I don't know, but I was like, man, wow, you know. And then, you know, again, I'm not trying to boast. I'm not trying to get full of myself, okay. But it's just very important to my testimony how I ended up. So, and again, for the first time in my life, I realized I was a very funny person. And so I was like, man, I've never been the life of the party, and now I'm the life of the party. And so my, my daughter is very embarrassed now. So. But so, you know, instead of being this shy introvert who never left his room to do anything at all except to eat dinner, uh, I became this huge party machine. When I say I partied, I partied, okay? I would go to clubs, and I would go to different parties and bars, and I'll be the one, when the music playing, I'll be the one on the stage or on a platform just dancing, and I can't dance. But I didn't care. When I was drunk, I thought I could dance. And so I was the one always doing that. Now, I went from a guy who didn't want the attention, didn't want to be noticed, to wanting everybody to notice me. Well, also because uh, at UC Irvine, 
I was in a fraternity. Um, that wasn't good because um, basically uh, there was a party every night of the week. So part of my testimony was I just went full on, just, you know, the typical PK kind of thing. I was just drinking and partying and partying and drinking and, well, you know, there are consequences to our actions, don't we? We know that for, for all of us who are adults. Maybe not kids, but adults. We know there are consequences to our actions. Well, my sophomore year, my first quarter, because UC Irvine was on a quarterly basis, so um, I was you know, put on academic probation. Second quarter, again, put on academic probation with a warning, get your act together or you're going to be expelled. However, I like drinking too much, and so I didn't get my act together. By the end of the uh, school year, uh, I was brought into the dean's office, and he expelled me. So, obviously, my mom and my dad didn't like that. They took it real hard. Now, understand, education, right, real important in the Asian culture. It was how they boast. It was what parents talked about, whether you're, you know, and it wasn't even about going to a, a college. It was all about going to certain colleges like Stanford or Berkeley or UCLA or MIT. And so it wasn't just about going to a college, but certain, you know, certain colleges. And so anyways, I begged and I said, let me live with you. I will get it turned around. I will, I will get it turned around, get my life turned around. And so I told them I will enroll in this local junior college next to where my mom and my dad lived. It was called Mount San Antonio College. I was lying actually, because I realized that in order to have insurance and basically stay on my father's insurance, I had to remain a full-time student. So for me, in order to have insurance, I had to be enrolled full-time. So I lied to them. I like partying too much. And so that's why I continued school. Anyway, so being a guy that was so full of himself and uh, was just, you know, just everywhere, I was just like the life of the party, I decided I was going to be an actor or model, whatever came first. And so um, in college, I took classes like acting 101, uh, modeling 101. Uh, interpretive dance 101, modern dance 101. Those were the classes I took. I mean, there's no effort in my part of trying to really get an education. Okay, I don't know, if, like, colleges out here have these kind of classes, but this is, you know, California, so. Anyway, so, in fact, I had a, uh, an agent at one point for a short, uh, for a short season, and, but see, my life of partying, did not stop. And unfortunately, I started hanging out with people that weren't bad, but just bad for me because they didn't have any goals or aspirations. They just wanted to get drunk and party. And so and the thing with LA is it's so big, so many people, there's always a huge party or 10 or 50 on a given night. So I, who is just bad for me? Well, every night I would go out Every night, I would be intoxicated. But see, even then, God was with me because even though driving intoxicated became a norm for me, I was never pulled over and I was never involved in an accident. See, even looking back, God's hand was, was on me. And then if I wasn't driving drunk, trying to get home, I was passed out somewhere on the streets of LA or Hollywood and waking up not even not knowing where I parked or where I was at and been a, uh, been cited a few times for public intoxication and so all these things so now hold on I don't want to make this a bragging money because I could but I don't want to so um, I want to say is I have changed as a person and worse yet I became very angry and very violent, especially towards my father. Many times in my early 20s, um, my father and my mom, because I was living with them, I had nowhere else to go, um, 
they would actually try to stop me from going out partying because, you know, my father's a, a pastor and, of course, you know, he didn't want, uh, you know, he just looked bad. And so many times he would try to restrain me and it would get physical. It would get physical. And many times my father, mother would try to get in the way and I would just throw them out of the way, shove them, pick them up, throw them out. And the thing that I hated about my father which was the fact that he was very physical and abusive to my mom. That was the very thing I became. I became very physical and physically abusive to my mom. Uh, there were two instances I remember specifically where my father tried to restrain me. And obviously you can see I'm a, a big guy, not your typical you know, size Asian. And my father was the, is the, typical size Asian, so there was no competition, and so, you know, he tried to, he, anyway, so let me just say this, that instance, I was so angry, I was trying to go to a party, he didn't like that, he got in my way, push comes to shove, well, something snapped, and I grabbed him by the collar, clenched my fist, bam, socked him in the face, and he fell back, knocked him out, but I saw his eyes as he was falling back. It was like, he was looking at me like, I hate you, you're scum, wish you never, I wish I never had you. And he fell back. And another instance I remember specifically was, again, I was trying to leave for a party, he was trying to restrain me, and this time was worse because he had just gotten into a fight with my mom very bad fight. And so I was angry with him already. It, he tried to restrain me. And of course, push comes to shove. I pinned him against the, the wall. And I told him, look, I hate you. And one of these days, I'm going to execute you. I will be the one to kill you. And that was how much I hated my father. So, you know, Obviously, with that, things are not going to go well between me and him and me and my mom. And so we made arrangements for me to live with my uncle, Brian. He loved me. He took me in. In fact, actually, I should say this. It was a time when I was actually turning my life around because I, um, I wasn't going to Mount San Antonio College anymore. By this time, I transferred to Citrus College. So you could understand, I squeezed like a lot of years to get my two-year degree, you know? I mean, I just squeezed like six years into, you know, anyways, made, made the most of it. But so I was kind of get my, uh, getting my life around, and I tried out for um, uh, the, the college tennis team, um, you know, and, and I made it. The funny thing is I play uh, football in high school, uh, and I messed around with tennis, but because, uh, you know, I don't, I, I, I pick up things very quickly. And so I made the team, and I became very good. In fact, I, I started, you know, some of my teammates were ranked players from Europe because a lot of these coaches would recruit amateur players from Europe to come because that helps the team. Plus, at the same time, a lot of European, young European tennis players, before they turn pro, they want to live in America, so they would come. And I remember uh, one of my teammates was a good friend of mine. His name was Peter Bjorlin. He was uh, ranked fifth as an amateur in all of Sweden. And then another guy, Rickard, I forget his last name, but he was ranked 11th as an amateur uh, in Sweden. So there are some good players that I played against. Well, with. Well, see, with all that said, here's the thing. In the summer of 1993, with all the partying, with all the drinking, with all the failed relationships, all these things, and unable to really see any meaning to life and unable to keep a job, actually, because there was a two-year span in my life, in my early 20s, and I counted back then. When I got saved, I counted. I, those two years, I held 14 different jobs. 14, I, I just couldn't hold a job. Get a job, get fired, get a job, get fired, get a job, get fired. That was me. 
And so because of, you know, the partying and uh, drinking and failed relationships, uh, you know, I went into a depression. I was really depressed. And I came to realize that my life was basically meaningless. It really was. And I had messed it up so much. And in my mind, I thought no one cared. Which, quite frankly, actually, I don't think anybody cared because I was scum. My parents didn't care, I don't think. Maybe they did, I'm not sure. Haven't talked to them about it. Like I said, there's, no. <laughs> but, so I, at the time, thought, what's, what's the point? What's the point? So, now, many, many times during those days, I would just veg out and, and lay around and just do nothing and contemplate suicide. That was it. And so I was, I was really contemplating suicide. Well, lucky for me, uh, in the fall of that year, 1993, I met this girl at a college and career Bible study at the Lutheran church that I was kind of frequenting. And, um, you know, her name was Yvette. And, and now Jody doesn't want me to say this. She hates it because she's obviously heard my testimony. But it's, you know, it's true. She was hot. And now Jody's hot, so she doesn't have anything to worry about. But, you know, but she was. And she was, you know, blonde, blue eyed, uh, very fun to be with. You know, we had a lot to be, uh, we had a lot in common. I mean, she loved the beach. I loved the beach. Um, uh, she loved to have fun. I loved to have fun. She was full of herself. I was full of myself. <laughs> she thought she was God's gift to men. I thought I was God's gift to women. So it was like match made in heaven. Anyways, well, after attending this Bible study, uh, I got her number and we started hanging out. And then guess what? She invited me to her church, Calvary Chapel, Costa Mesa. And now you think this is when things start to turn around. Well, it doesn't because, um, you know, when life becomes meaningless and, and then you think somehow you just like find the meaning to life, right? And it's because of someone or a relationship. Look, I'll just tell you this. That's a, that's a very fragile way of finding meaning to life because man and woman will always fail you. Well, see, that was 1993, and that fall uh, was good. It was the best ever up until then. And that Christmas was great, okay? Because obviously my parents were always busy, and so they didn't have time to celebrate Christmas with me. And so she spent her whole vacation, I don't know, just hanging out. But see, soon after the New Year's, um, she broke up with me because... I, I was unfaithful, and so it was my fault. But again, I realized, man, I blew it again. Uh, I realized that I was 23, and I had just messed up royally again. Went into a depression. I thought I lost the best thing that could have ever happened to me. And on top of that, I, was a, I wasn't even like a college dropout. I was kicked out. And so my relationship with my parents were non-existent. They were afraid of me. And then by this time, my uncle was afraid of me because of my anger. And, you know, for example, like my anger, I was the poster boy for road rage. Like, if you were to look up, like, the definition of road rage, it would be me next to my car with a hammer, you know? I remember one night, about 1 or 2 a.m. in the morning, I, I, I think it was after a party, I was driving on Highway 55 in Tustin, and luckily the roads were kind of empty, and it was dark, it was late, and I was, I was driving, I was trying to get back home. Somebody cut me off. So I sped up, got in front of him, slammed on my brakes. He almost hit me, but luckily he actually stopped. And I got out of my car. I was in the middle of the freeway. I was going to pummel him because I was that angry. I, was, I had a short fuse. And lucky for me, he kind of sped off and, you know. 
So you have like this anger issue that I had. And on top of that, the depression. And then what's, what was worse was that depression was getting worse. Uh, you know, to realize that you are scum. It, to, to spend the nights where I spent and then waking up not knowing where you're at. And, you know, to, to look at people and look at women the way I did. And, and the worst yet, I felt so hopeless because I knew there was nothing I could do to turn it around. I reached out to the pastor at the Lutheran Church. He didn't want anything to do with me. And that's another story in itself. But I was seeing a, a therapist at the time on a weekly basis. You know what she said to me? Steve, when, when life gets tough, take a nap. Like when you get so angry, take a nap. Because, you know, she said that's what she did. I was like, take a nap? I wake up angry. I mean, I do. I wake up angry. And so, how is that going to help? Well, then, uh, as if it was like God getting my attention or my, my depression and all these things, I began to feel this this heavy pain upon my chest. It was a physical pain that I actually felt. Uh, it was unbearable to where I was convinced that the only thing left for me to do was to take my own life. I was so done. I had been contemplating suicide for over a year and I was like, I'm done. You see, you can live without many things. You can live without a car, you can live without a house, a meaningful relationship. You can live without good hair. Can I get an amen, Michael? <laughs> but see, you cannot live without hope. You can. A person cannot survive without hope. That's why, as a Christian, God gives us the hope that we need. The hope that, for one thing, he's in control. Another thing is the hope that no matter how bad it gets, he will never leave us. Even though everybody else might forsake us, he will never leave us. And then, the hope that he's coming soon. And that one day, this will not matter. We'll be in his presence one day. That's the hope we all have. So, on top of wanting to kill myself now, um, now, what happened was also, right before I got saved, again, the anger for my, my father and, and the hatred for him, the bitterness, you know, I decided I wanted to hurt him really bad. And, I, you know, I contemplated doing several things and different things, but I thought, you know what? The best way to hurt him, to hurt him long term, was to take my own life leave a suicide note, and blame it on him. Blame it on him. It's your fault, Dad. It's your fault I messed up. And every time he thought about me or saw a picture of me, he would hurt. <laughs> I did something. Never mind. <laughs> Anyways, uh, so it got really bad, and I decided one night I was going to end it. I was just tired of struggling. I was living with my uncle, Uncle Brian, and, you know, it was early February of 1994. And that night, I decided, I was it. I'm going to cut my wrist and, and just bleed. And just bleed to death. Now, don't judge me. You might think, that's a really girly way to die. <laughs> right? Only girls cut their wrists. Uh, no, I understand. In L.A., nobody had a gun, okay? You were, you had to be a gangster in order to have a gun, okay? I didn't have a gun. I would have, but so I thought, okay, I'll cut my wrist. And so I made a phone call, one phone call to my sister's best friend because now my sister was the only one in my life that has ever took time for me. And I knew she loved me, the only one. So I wanted to say goodbye to her, but I knew that if I called her, she would have 
know, try to talk me out of it. Well, what she would do is drop everything and intervene. And so I didn't want that. So I called her best friend, Elaine, and I asked her to tell my sister I loved her. Well, Elaine had become a born-again Christian, much like my sister. So because she knew I was messed up because everybody knew I was messed up and she knew what, what I was about to do. And so she told me, Steve, please don't. And these were her words. Please wait just one night. Just one night. I'm going to pray, spend the night to pray for you. She said, my God is a God of miracles, and I know that his desire is to come through and show, your, uh, show himself to you tonight. Let me pray for you. Don't do it. Not tonight, please. Just one night. Give me one night. So I thought, you know what? The next day was the first day of classes for a brand new semester at Citrus College. So I thought, you know what? Fine. One night. I'll give it to you. Okay? One night. I could go to school, meet some girls, see where I could get with them, and then come back and kill myself. So I held it off. I tried to go to sleep. Couldn't go to sleep the very next day. You know, I got dressed. Um, you know, got ready. Got in my car. Started to drive to school. Well, uh, you know, my uncle's house was in Laverne, California, and to get to Citrus College, which, uh, you guys don't know this, but it's in Azusa, California. It takes about 15 minutes, and it takes you going on the 210 freeway to get there. So as I was driving to get on the freeway, I wasn't really paying attention. I was, you know, suicidal. Come on, don't blame me. Anyways, so when I was driving uh, to get to the on-ramp, I... I cut my, uh, not I cut, I, I cut, uh, I cut somebody off basically. I just was not paying attention, which actually nothing's changed, has it? <laughs> Except I can't blame it now on the fact that, you know, I'm suicidal. Anyways, so I'm driving, getting on the freeway, cut this truck off. It was a two-lane on-ramp, very long two-lane. I'm on it, and I noticed that this guy is trying to pass me up. And by this time, I realized I, I cut him off, didn't I? And he's probably, probably wanting to get ahead of me to cut me off, because that's what I would do. So I started speeding up. And he started speeding up. And then, well, I couldn't speed up anymore, because I was driving a Nissan Sentra. So, <laughs> and so it wasn't like I was going to get too fast, but it was fast enough. He got in front of me, cut me off as we were getting on the freeway. And I did something that you should not do in that situation. I jerked the wheel. <laughs> you don't do that when you're going fast. Anyways, I jerked the wheel. <sighs> My car went spinning across the freeway. Um, not a 360, uh, more than that was one time and a half around. And so ended up slamming into the center divider. It was a concrete center divider. And luckily for me, there was nobody else on the freeway because it was early, except for an off-duty police officer who was behind us and saw everything. And so he stopped and came, uh, came to my car. And you know, by this time, the car was facing the opposite direction of traffic. The passenger side of the car is completely wrecked. And I have pictures of it, actually. But... You know, he came up to the door, he tried to get me out, and he helped me out. Now, by this time, the truck that cut me off had already sped away. So I got out, and I'm a little dazed and, and kind of confused and looking at him. And then, he, you know, he looked into the car, and these were his very words. And I still remember them. He said, man, you're lucky you're not hurt. That's a miracle. You're not dead. And I was like, what are you talking about, miracle? And so I, I looked down at the car, and where my head should have been was a piece of metal, a, a rebarb or something from the center concrete divider that had shot through when I slammed into the center divider. And I don't know, I don't know how it missed me. 
So, right then, then, it was almost as if like the blinders came off. I didn't know what to do. I, mean, I was like, this is God. So right there in the middle of Interstate 210, God spoke to me. And I realized that the night before, I wanted to kill myself. Be done with Steve Wang. I was useless, I was scum, empty, lonely, hopeless, worthless. And I wanted to end my life. But God stepped in and told me no. And then the very next day, standing between eastbound and westbound, 210, I realized, hey, now God had a chance to wipe me out, to do away with Steve Wang, to do, with, do, to do away with a scum bucket, do everybody a favor. And he didn't. Do you see that? The very night, I'm done. I was going to do, he said, no, don't do it. He intervened through my friend, my sister's friend. Give me one night to pray. The very next day, get in an accident. He could have take, he taken my life. He could have snuffed me out, but he didn't. And then I was standing there, right between the westbound and eastbound. And I was like, God, why? And then he just spoke his word into my heart because I love you. I love you. And right then and there, again, in the middle of these know, traffic going by, I mean, like 85, 90 miles per hour, because this is LA, you know, I broke down in front of the cop and everybody, and I just was like, God, Jesus, if you want me, I'm yours. I'm yours. Now, that's when I made a decision and I became born again. That's my story. And I've never stopped chasing the Lord since. I don't know what you guys are going through right now. Many of you guys, like Maury said, are new here. So I don't know what you guys are going through. But if you're at a point in your life where you're feeling hopeless, if you made a, a mess of your life, or maybe, God forbid, you're contemplating suicide and are afraid to tell anyone because you're ashamed, these thoughts are coming into your head. And look, I want you to know there is hope. There is hope. Maybe you don't see it, there is. Don't turn to the world. The world has nothing to offer you that is lasting. The, the Bible says sin is only pleasurable for a season. That's it. Don't go chasing the wind. What God has to offer in his son as he resides in us is for real. So, I don't want to get too much like emotional and try to do an altar call. I just want to say that like, if you don't know the Lord, I'm going to make myself available after the service. And I know that many of the elders will be up front too after the communion service. Don't leave here without having us pray for you. If you don't know what the gospel is, don't leave here without finding out what the gospel is. Look, maybe you're here because, well, you don't know why. You woke up this morning, you're on vacation here in Williamsburg, and you thought you'd try out this church. You were trying to go to, you know, the outlet mall, but you made a wrong turn. I don't know, but you're here for a purpose. And so, let's pray. Lord, I just pray that um, as you now, as you now have spoken, using my testimony, I pray that you will speak to hearts here. 
just quiet this time now as we enter into the uh, communion portion of the service. May you be glorified right now. In Jesus' name, amen. The ushers are going to pass out the bread and the cup. And that always strikes me about the communion service. There are many things that strike me about the communion service, but one of the things is what we have the juice in. That dinky old plastic cup. You know, in the history of the church, we've made a huge deal. Now, obviously, communion service is very big, very important we've used in certain Christian circles and certain denominations and backgrounds, we use golden chalices and special things to, to hold 
the wine, or as we use it in Calvary Chapel, the grape juice. But one of the things that really strike me as I look down, now you have the bread, which is broken for us. But you also have the cup, which contains the new covenant. It's in a very insignificant, cheap, plastic cup. Small, little, and we throw it away afterwards. But how is it that in the church now, today's church, modern day, in America especially, we make it all about, if you want to say it, the cup, the vessel. We make it all about the person and not what's in it, not what's in it. See, it's all about what's in that cup that is significant, that makes it the new covenant. And that is, that is the juice. That is the blood that was shed by, by Christ on Calvary. But the new church here in America, there's a trend. It's all about the person. We make Christianity out to be like the world. We have superstar Christians, whether it's in music or mega, mega church pastors or parachurch church organizations, and, and we make it all about the vessel. I want you guys to contemplate about how it's all about the Lord and what he's done and not anything about you. The, the quickest way for you to become, or the quickest way for you to, to quench the Holy Spirit is to make it about yourself and not about the Lord. 1 Corinthians chapter 11. There, as Paul's kind of dealing with many problems in the Corinthian church, and there were a lot of problems, um, a lot of abuses, especially with the Lord's Supper, he said that, that the Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, he took the bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it because he had to be broken for us and said, take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. So, if you wanna join me, let's pray. Lord, I, I just pray that we would all be impacted by the significance of his body broken for us. And we take this to remember you in Jesus' name. Let's go and partake of the bread. in the same manner. He also took the cup and said, this, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Again, this is you. Nothing significant. I cannot overstate this enough. You might think you're special, but my I hate to break the news to you. You're not. Christ is special. Amen. You might look better than somebody else here. You might sing better than somebody else here. You might be able to run a little bit faster than somebody else here. But it would almost be like uh, maybe like a dunghill, like some poop on the ground, some cow patty, saying to another cow patty, I smell better than you. Mm -hmm. You're still a cow patty, you know? You're not anything significant. It's all about Christ. Amen. Yes. Lord, I just thank you so much for the new covenant. I mean, you just impress it upon our hearts. It's all about you. Let's go ahead and partake.
Lord, I pray a blessing upon everybody here, and especially a blessing upon Pastor Tom and Jean. Bless their time as they renew their marriage. They're such a blessing, not just to me, but to everybody here. I know it. And so continue to refresh them, and as you bring them back next week, give them a, a, a freshness, a fresh wind, a fresh message, a fresh fire. And I um, also want to pray, all of you, if you need prayer, there'll be elders that are going to be up here. Don't leave without prayer. Don't. Let me just say this, and I say this to my fellowship a lot. I'm not a doctor, obviously. I'm not. So if you have an illness, I can't offer you a prescription. I'm not an, an accountant. If you're struggling financially, I can't help you there. I'm not a lawyer. You know, if you're hurting legally, I can't help you. What I am is a pastor. The only thing I could offer, which is the only thing that matters, is prayer. I can't give you counsel in any other, uh, other, other way in terms of finances, in terms of medically or health, but I can offer you prayer. So don't leave here without praying. If you need prayer, the elders will be up front. Again, come up for prayer. And we do have, they want me to say, lunch. So don't leave without eating. Mm -hmm. Don't, okay? Uh, so God bless you guys. There's going to be a closing song, right? So God bless you guys.